Today I'm talking to Professor Sarah Hutton from the University of York. She is well known to all of us, especially here in Paderborn, as she has often visited us and already in 2014 as visiting professor. Today she is being awarded the Elizabeth of Bohemia and Hereford Prize donated by Ulrike Detmers. So first of all, let me say many congratulations on being awarded this prize. Thank you very much. The Elizabeth of Bohemia Prize awarded to an outstanding contemporary philosopher in memory of Elizabeth of Bohemia is intended to acknowledge the work of an international scholar whose work best preserves the memory of women philosophers. This year, the prize recognizes the research of Professor uh, Sarah Hutton. Her research focuses on Renaissance and 17th century literatures and inter uh, intellectual history, including history of science and history of philosophy. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> she is also a specialist on the, in the, on the history of women philosophers and an international expert on early modern women's writings. Her many publications include a re-edition on Anne Conway's letters and many articles on Anne Conway, Margaret Cavendish, Mary Estelle and Emily de Chatelet. So what led you as a pioneer, so to speak, to work on the history of women philosophers? Was it a desire to fill the gap that exists in the sources of women philosophers, especially when we think on the neglect of Anne Conway or and of early modern Neoplatonism more broadly? Well, I was always interested in the women thinkers of the past, but when I graduated, there wasn't any work really being done on them. And it was really my work on the Cambridge Platonists which led me to, to work on women philosophers, together with an increasing um, atmosphere of interest um, as the women's movement gathered pace in the history of women generally. It, I think it was particularly when I was working on the new edition of the Conway Letters. Well, it's not a new edition, it's a revised edition. I came to realise that Anne Conway was a very significant figure. There were already people interested in her, but um, th th there was very little written on her. So that led me to work on Anne Conway, and through that, um, broadened my interest more generally in, in, in women um, of the 17th century. So I, I think when I graduated, if I'd set out to work on women philosophers, I, I don't think my career would have gone, gone anywhere because there simply wasn't that kind of interest. It was all regarded as a rather niche interest in those days. Yeah. So what role did Elizabeth Bopemia play in your choice to work on women philosophers? Well, um, I was curious to find out who, uh, what, how many other women there were who, who did philosophy, and she's one who stands out because, um, because of her relationship with Descartes, because of the letters, which of course by now have been published, we were aware of her. We were, all students of Descartes were aware of her, um, either through the prefaces or through her letters. And um, yes, that she was definitely a, a figure on the horizon. The, cure, the, the, the big question it, for everybody is, um, was, was her correspondence with Descartes all she wrote, or all she um, did in the way of philosophy, or was there any more? I mean, I think we're all agreed that the, there was much more, and this is just a tiny fragment of, of, um, of what she philosophized. Yeah, exactly. And that is why in 2021, there was this fabulous work on Elizabeth of Bohemia, a philosopher in her historical context, which you co-edited with Sabrina Ebelsmeyer. And in this book, you have also published an article on Anne Conway and Elizabeth. And I was uh, wondering if you could give us some insight. So did both philosophers have contact? Were they aware of each other's philosophy? And or how can we explain that there was there are so many numerous similarities in their philosophies? Well, as I as I explained in that article, um, it is it is tantalising. There seem to be so many uh, circumstantial uh, um, commonalities between them. They knew the same people. Um, they were contemporaries. Um, certainly, Elizabeth. Um, Knew, we have evidence that they knew of each other, but there is no surviving evidence of them having direct contact with each other. And so we must just kind of assume that any contact was indirect through, uh, through their 
the context which they had in common, principally Francis Mercury van Helmont and, and Henry Moore. As to um, the extent to which their philosophies um, overlap, again, it's very difficult to judge. What we do know is that they were both introduced to philosophy through, through Cartesianism. Um, Elizabeth had the enormous um, privilege of, of actually personal contact with Descartes. Um, Anne Conway, uh, by the time Anne Conway studied philosophy, Descartes was uh, uh, dead, but her teacher, Henry Moore, had been in correspondence with Descartes. Um, and so, and, and one or two of the letters that they exchanged on Cartesianism survive. So we know that their beginning point was a similar one. We also know that they both made criticisms of, uh, of Descartes' dualism. Um, but um, how their philosophy developed from that is, is, is one of the big unknown questions. It's evident from other things that Elizabeth seems to have remained faithful to Descartes, um, but in the case of Conway, we do know that she uh, developed a philosophical system which, which repudiated the basis of, of Cartesian philosophy, although she was very, she was very, um, she admired Descartes' uh, abilities in natural philosophy. Um, she, she didn't think that his metaphysics worked. Okay, and you mentioned before that when you graduated there was not much uh, sources of women's philosophers. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering when I had a look at your articles on Anne Conway and on Emily Chatelet, that there was one striking question. Can we speak of these women only as philosophers when we have uh, them in comparison with their, male, with their male colleagues? Or was this a fate, a manner to write, to not shock the tradition, I will, I will say, and that now leaves more and more place for writing only about women? Because that's, when one has a look at the articles in uh, 20 years uh, ago, one sees this comparison between, I do not know, Descartes and Elizabeth of Bohemia, or Henry Moore and, uh, and Conway, but now they are more and more only on Anne Conway, only on Elizabeth of Bohemia. Well, first of all, it's not a precondition that women only philosophize in relation to men. Um, this is a historical, a historical um, phenomenon that the women that we know about, uh, many of them did philosophize in relation to men, and it's that which has helped their, their philosophy, or at least the fact that they philosophize survive. But that wasn't always a help to them. Elizabeth was for a long time considered as a learned lady. Um, and Anne Conway, well, um, well, nobody much is interested in Henry Moore anymore, so they, they sort of put her in the same box as, 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 a, as Moore, as a, um, an uninteresting philosopher. Um, and one must, of course, remember also the, the kind of history of philosophy that was around 30 or 40 years ago, which really focused on major figures. Um, if a major figure had contact with a, a, a woman, then that woman might, might rate a, a, a passing mention. Damaris Masham is, a, is, is, another, is another example. Um, but again, it's, it's problematic because on the one hand, the historical accident, if you like, of, of contact with a, with a, with a canonical, what a, a figure who is now considered canonical, has meant the survival of her name and some of her ideas. Um, on the other hand, the way we've canonized figures has in, in, inevitably meant that those women have been sort of downgraded to, to sort of, as a mere, there's a, there's a rather curious English word, help meet, a sort of a, assistant or a sort of a kind of, in ways, gen, generally in second rank in relation to, a minor figure in relation to, to the man. But um, with more, with more historical work, and especially as we recover other writings, although that again is another problem, um, as we recover other writings, it becomes evident that the, the chance of them having contact with a man was, was a, a male philosopher came right out of the fact that they were philosophers in their, in, of, of their own right. It is interesting to me that in the 17th century, the, the men with whom they had contact were actually um, encouraged, encouraged them in their pursuits. I mean, Henry Moore taught Anne Conway. He took her on as a pupil. 
and he, he said publicly that he didn't know of anybody as, as intelligent and as uh, of greater natural parts with his brainier than, than, than she was. Um, he was probably inspired by Descartes' example um, uh, in, in writing to Elizabeth. Uh, uh, Moore had great admiration for Descartes, um, certainly in his, 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 his younger career. And um, so, so these men have really, um, perhaps unwittingly, played a role in preserving uh, our knowledge about these women. There is a, but I see them as a beginning point, um, uh, encouraging us to go further, to look, to look further. And uh, it, it's not by any means a, 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 a foregone conclusion that women only philosophized in relation to men. But um, bearing in mind the difficulties they had in education and other disadvantages, um, certainly in earlier periods, uh, the, the, if, even if they were totally dependent on men, it was certainly helpful to have that kind of contact because it was an entree into what was still a very masculine uh, intellectual world. Yeah. So we have not only to preserve tradition, but also to open this tradition, to uh, open the canon for women philosophers. And um, as I saw, you are the, on the board of management of the Journal of the History of Philosophy and a member of the editorial board of the British Journal of the History of Philosophy. So are these two positions, I will say, possibilities uh, for you to advocate for women philosophers? Today. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm actually no longer on that board. <laughs> I'm, I have now uh, retired from that. But, 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 but certainly yes. And I think actually, uh, well, not in the case of the British Journal, because I was on the board from from the beginning there. But I think my interest in in women philosophers was a factor in my appointment to the Journal of the History of Philosophy, um, because they they wanted that expertise on on their board, and um, they. Um, um, and yes, I mean, I think both journals um, have, have played a part in, in um, carrying articles on, on women. In fact, the British Journal of History of Philosophy published my first article on um, women philosophers on Danbury's Masham in, in the, the second issue of the first, the first volume, which I think was a very good uh, indication of the determination of the founders to be, to be about a new kind of historiography which was op more open than the, 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 what was around at the time. Um, and uh, certainly they, they, the way they've developed, certainly in the British case of the British Journal, they've really opened out um, to, to include women, not just early modern women, but there are now special issues on 19th century and 20th century women. And the, the, um, the, the Journal of the History of Philosophy too is, is, is certainly publishing more on women. So many thank you for this interview uh, and again congratulations on the Elizabeth of Virginia Award. Thank you very much, it's a great honour to receive it. <laughs>